Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, the House managers have said throughout their presentation and throughout all of the proceedings here again and again that you can't have a trial without witnesses and documents, as if it's just that simple. If you're going to have a trial, there have to be new witnesses and documents, but it's not that simple. And that's really something that is a trope that's being used to disguise the real issues, the real decisions that you'd be making on this, on this decision about witnesses, because there's a lot more at stake there. And let me unpack that and explain what's really at stake there. The first is this idea that if you come to trial, you've always got to go to witnesses, have new witnesses come in and that. But that's not true. In every legal system, and in our legal systems on both civil and criminal sides, there's a way to, to decide right up front in some quick way whether there's really a triable issue, whether you really need to go to all the trouble of calling in new witnesses and having more evidence and something like that. And there's not here. There's no need for that. Because these articles of impeachment on their face are defective. And we've explained that. Let me start with the second article on the obstruction charge. We've explained that that charge is really trying to say that it's an impeachable offense for the president to defend the separation of powers. That can't be right. But it's also the case that no witnesses are going to say anything that makes any difference to the second article of impeachment. That all has to do with the validity of the grounds the president asserted, the fact that he asserted long-standing constitutional prerogatives of the executive branch in specific ways to resist specific deficiencies in the subpoenas that were issued. No fact witness is going to come in and say anything that relates in any way to that. It's not going to make any difference. And on the first article of impeachment, that too is defective on its face. And we've explained, we heard it again today here, that the way they, they have this subjective theory of impeachment, that will show abuse of power by focusing just on the president's subjective motives. And they said again today here, that the way they can show the president did something wrong is that he defied the foreign policy of the United States. And we talked, I talked about that before, this theory that he defied the agencies within the executive branch. He wasn't following the policy of the executive branch. That's not a constitutionally coherent statement. The theory of abuse of power that they framed in the first article of impeachment would do grave damage to the separation of powers under our Constitution. Because it would become so malleable, they can pour into it anything they want to find illicit motives for some perfectly permissible action. It becomes so malleable, it's no different than maladministration, the exact ground that the framers rejected during the Constitutional Convention. The Constitution defines specific offenses. It limits and constrains the impeachment power. Now, there's also the fact that we actually heard from a lot of witnesses. We heard from a lot of witnesses in the proceedings so far. You've heard 192 video clips, by our count, from 13 different witnesses. There were 17 witnesses deposed in closed hearings in the House, and 12 of them testified again in open hearings. You've got all of those transcripts, so you can see the witnesses' testimony there. The key portions have been played for you on the screens. And you've got over 28,000 pages of documents and transcripts. You've got a lot of evidence already. But there's another principle that they overlook when they say, well, if you're going to have a trial, there just have to be witnesses, as if the most ordinary thing is you get to trial and then start subpoenaing new witnesses and documents. That's not true either. And we pointed this out. There's, in the regular courts, the way things work is you've got to do a lot of work preparing a trial called discovery to find out about witnesses and depose them and find out about documents before you get to trial. You can't show up the day of trial and say, oh, Your Honor, actually, we're not ready we didn't subpoena John Bolton, or witness X, or witness Y. And now we want to subpoena that witness. Now we want to do discovery. And why does that matter here? 
Because here, to show up not having done the work and to expect that work to be done in the Senate by this body has grave consequences for the institutional interests of this body, and it sets a precedent, really it sets an important precedent for two bodies, for the Senate and for the House. Because what the Senate accepts as an impeachment coming from the House determines not just precedent for the Senate, but really precedent for the House in the future as well. If the procedures used in the House to bring this proceeding here to this stage are accepted, if the Senate says, yes, we'll start calling new witnesses because you didn't get the job done, and whatever process you use to get it here, then that becomes the new normal. And that's important in a couple of ways. One is, as we've pointed out, the totally unprecedented process that was used in the House that violated all notions of due process. There are precedents going back 150 years in the House ensuring that someone accused in an impeachment hearing in the House has due process rights to be represented by counsel, to cross-examine witnesses, to be able to present evidence. They didn't allow the President to do that here. And if this body says that's okay, then that becomes the new normal. And they, they stand up here, the House managers, and say, this body would be unfair if this body doesn't call the witnesses. They talk about fairness. Where was the fairness in that proceeding in the House? And Manager Schiff says things would be arbitrary if you don't do what they say and call the witnesses they want. Well, wasn't it arbitrary in the House when they wouldn't allow the president to be represented by counsel, wouldn't allow the president to call witnesses? There was no precedent in a presidential impeachment inquiry to have open hearings where the president and his counsel were excluded. It also would set a precedent to allow a package, a proceeding from the House to come here that the House managers say, well, now we need new witnesses. We haven't done all the work. And it's witnesses they didn't even try to get. They didn't subpoena John Bolton. And they didn't go through the process when other witnesses were subpoenaed. When Dr. Kupperman, Charlie Kupperman went to court, they withdrew the subpoena. And now to say that, well, fairness demands that this body has to do all that work, that sets a new precedent as well. And it changes, it would change for all the future the relationship between the House and the Senate in impeachment inquiries. It would mean that the Senate has to become the investigatory body. And the principles that they assert, they, they did a process that wasn't fair. They did a process that was arbitrary, that arbitrarily denied the President rights. They did a process that wouldn't allow witnesses. And then they came here on the first night Remember when we were all here until 2 o'clock and in very belligerent terms said to the members of this body, you're on trial. It will be treachery if you don't do what the House managers say. That's not right. When it was their errors, when they were arbitrary and they didn't provide fairness, they can't project that onto this body to try to say that you have to make up for their errors, and if you don't, the fault lies here. Now, they also suggest that it's not going to take a long time, that they only want a few witnesses. But of course, if things are opened up to witnesses, and it is going to be fair, it's not just one side, it's not just the witnesses that they would want. The President would have to be permitted to have witnesses. And with all respect, Mr. Chief Justice, the idea that if a subpoena is sent to a senior advisor to the President and the President determines that he will stand by the principle of immunity that's been asserted by virtually every President since Nixon, that that'll just be resolved by the Senate right here, whether or not that privilege exists. 
by the Chief Justice sitting as presiding officer, that doesn't make sense. That's not the way it works. The, the Senate, even when the Chief Justice is the presiding officer here, can't unilaterally decide the privileges of the executive branch. That dispute would have to be resolved in another way, and it could involve litigation, and it could take a lot of time. So the idea that this will all be done quickly, if everyone just does what the House managers say, is not realistic. It's not the way that the process would actually have to play out in accord with the Constitution. And that has another significant consequence. Again, affecting this institution as a precedent going forward. Because what it suggests, the new normal that would be created then is kind of an express path for precisely the sort of impeachments that the framers most feared. The framers recognized that impeachments could be done for illegitimate reasons. They recognized that there could be partisan impeachments. And if this is the new normal, this is the very epitome of a partisan impeachment. There was bipartisan opposition to it in the House. And it was rushed through with unfair procedures, 78 days total of inquiry. Think about that. In Nixon, there had been investigating committees and there was a special prosecutor long before the House Judiciary Committee started its investigation. In Clinton, there was a special counsel, an independent counsel, for the better part of a year before the House Judiciary Committee even started hearings. Everything from start to finish, in this case, from September 24th to the articles of impeachment were considered in the Judiciary Committee, was done in 78 days. In 78 days, and for the 71 of them, the President was entirely locked out. So the new normal would be slapdash, get it done quickly, unfair procedures in the House to impeach a president, then bring it to the Senate, and then all the real work of investigation and discovery is going to have to take place with that impeachment hanging over the president's head. And that's a particular thing that the framers also were concerned about. And I mentioned this the other day. In Federalist Number 65, Hamilton warned specifically about what he called, and I'm quoting, the injury to the innocent from the procrastinated determination of the charges which might be brought against them. Because he understood that if an impeachment charge from the House wasn't resolved quickly, it was hang if it was hanging over the President's head, that in itself would be a problem. And that's why they structured the impeachment process so that the Senate could be able to swiftly determine impeachments that were brought. That also suggests that's why there is a system for having thorough investigation, thorough process done in the House. And Hamilton explained the delay after the impeachment would afford an opportunity for intrigue and corruption. And it would also be, as he put it, a detriment to the state from the prolonged inaction of men whose firm and faithful execution of their duty might have exposed them to the persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. And that's what's happened here. And if you create a system now that makes the new normal a half-baked slapdash process in the House, just get the impeachment done and get it over to the Senate, and then once the President's impeached, and you have the head of the executive branch, the leader of the free world, having something like that hanging over his head, then we'll slow everything down, and then we'll start doing the investigation and just drag it out. That's all part of what makes this even more political, especially in an election year. It's not the process that the framers had in mind, and it's not something the Senate should condone in this case. 
The Senate is not here to do the investigatory work that the House didn't do. Where there's been a process that denied all due process, that produced a record that can't be relied upon, the reaction from this body should be to reject the articles of impeachment, not to condone and put its imprimatur on the way the proceedings were handled in the House, and not to prolong matters further by trying to redo work that the House failed to do by not seeking evidence and not doing a fair and legitimate process to bring the articles of, impe of impeachment here. Thank you. Mr. Sekulow. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, over a seven-day period, you did hear evidence. You heard evidence from 13 different witnesses, 192 video clips, and as my colleague, the Deputy White House Counsel said, over 28,000 pages of documents. You heard testimony from Gordon Sondland. He's the United States Ambassador to the European Union. You heard that testimony. He testified in the House proceedings. I did not have an opportunity to cross-examine cross him. If we get witnesses, I have to have that opportunity. William Taylor, former acting United States Ambassador of the Ukraine, testified. You heard his testimony. We didn't get the opportunity to cross-examine him. He would be called. Tim Morrison, the former senior director for Europe and Russia of the National Security Council. You saw his testimony. They put it up. We didn't get an opportunity. We did not have an opportunity to cross-examine him. Jennifer Williams, special advisor on Europe and Russia for Vice President Mike Pence. You saw her testimony. They put it up. I did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. If we call witnesses, we would have to have that opportunity. David Holmes, the political counsel at the United States Embassy in Ukraine, saw testimony from him. We're not able to cross-examine. If he's called, or if we get witnesses, we will call the ambassador, and we will cross-examine. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, you saw his testimony appear before the House. We didn't have the opportunity to cross-examine him. If we call witnesses, we will, of course, have that right to cross-examine him. Fiona Hill, she is the former Senior Director for Europe and Russia on National Security Council. She testified before the House. If we have witnesses, we have the opportunity to call her then and cross-examine Fiona Hill. Kurt Volker, former United States Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations. They called him. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine. If we're calling witnesses, these are witnesses you've heard from, we would have the right to call witnesses and to cross-examine Mr. Volker. George Kent, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. You saw his testimony. They called him. If we have witnesses, we have the right to call that witness and to cross-examine Deputy Assistant Secretary Kent. The former United States Ambassador to Ukraine, Ambassador Yovanovitch, they called her. You saw that testimony. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. If we have witnesses, we would have to call her. Laura Cooper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. They called her. You saw her witness testimony right here. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. We would have to be given that opportunity. These are witnesses against the President. Laura Cooper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Again, same thing. David Hale, you're not Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He was called by the House. You saw his testimony. We never had the opportunity to cross-examine. If we have witnesses, we have to have the opportunity to do that. There were other witnesses that were called, or you saw their testimony, or heard their testimony, where it was referred to Catherine Croft, the Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiations, Department of the State, Mark Sandy, the Deputy Associate Director for National Security Programs, and Christopher Anderson, Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiations, Department of State. You heard 
their testimony referred to, we did not have the opportunity to cross-examine them. So this isn't going to happen if witnesses are called in a week. Now, that's just the witnesses that have been produced that you have seen by the house managers. You are being called upon to make consequential constitutional decisions. Consequential decisions for our Constitution. We talk about the burden of proof. I've said this before, I'll, I'll say it again, 31 times the manager said they proved their case, 29 times they said the evidence was overwhelming. Manager Nadler, he didn't only say it was overwhelming in his view. On page 739 of the congressional record, he's very clear. He says, not only is it strong, there is no doubt. That's what he says. The one thing that the House managers think the President Council has got right is quoting me, talking about Mr. Nadler, Manager Nadler, as saying, beyond any doubt, it is indeed beyond any doubt. Now, of course, we think that they have not proven their case by any stretch of any proper constitutional analysis. In the Clinton investigation, they talk about witnesses being called, but the three witnesses that were called had either testified before the grand jury or before the House committees. These weren't new witnesses. What Mr. Philbin said is, is correct. Under our constitutional design, they're supposed to investigate. You are to deliberate. But what they're asking you to do is now become the investigative agency, the investigative body. If they needed all this additional evidence, which they said they don't need, and by the way, not only did they say it in the record, this is House Manager Nadler, quote, this on, when he was on CNN back on the 15th of this month, we brought the articles of impeachment because despite the fact that we didn't hear from many witnesses, we could have heard from, we heard from enough witnesses to prove the case beyond any doubt at all. The same can be said of Representative Lofgren. You know we've had, we have evidence proving the case through, for example, at the meeting when Bolton said it was a drug deal. Well, we have fact witnesses. Hill was there, Vindman was there, Sondland was there. So this idea that they haven't had witnesses, is that's the smokescreen. You've heard from a lot of witnesses. The problem with the case the problem with their position is, even with all of those witnesses, it doesn't prove up an impeachable offense. The articles fail. I think it's very dangerous if the House runs up, which they did, articles of impeachment quickly, so quickly that they are clamoring for evidence despite the fact that they put all of this evidence forward. They got their wish of an impeachment by Christmas. That was the goal. But now they want you to do the work they failed to do. But as I said, time and time again we heard, you didn't hear from witnesses, you didn't hear from many witnesses. You, Mr. Schiff modified that a little bit today. A little bit. You heard from a lot of witnesses. But if we go down the road of witnesses, this is not a one-week process. Remember I talked about the waving the wand and Ukrainian corruption in Ukraine was gone? You're not going to have a witness wand here where we just say, okay, you got a week to do this and get it done. There's no way that would be proper under due process. But you know, due process is supposed to be for the person accused. And they are turning it on its head. They brought the articles before you. They're the ones that rushed the case up and then held it before you could actually start the proceedings. But they're the ones that passed the articles before Christmas. You know, we talked a lot about the court system and the fact that they were seeking witnesses. And when it got close to actually having a court proceeding, they decided that they didn't want to have that witness go through that proceeding. They actually withdrew the subpoena to moot the case out. How many constitutional challenges will we have in this body because they placed a burden on you that they wouldn't take themselves in putting their case forward? 
if we look at our constitutional framework and our constitutional structure, um, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Now, our opposition to this motion is rather straightforward, as I've said. We came here ready to try the case on the record that they presented. The record that the managers told us was overwhelming and complete Mr. Schiff went through every sentence of the articles of impeachment just a few days ago and said, proved, proved, proved. The problem is what it proved, proved, proved is not an impeachable offense. You could, you could have witnesses that prove a lot of things, but if there's not a violation of a law, if it doesn't meet the constitutional required process, the Constitution required substantive issues of do these articles, these allegations rise to the level of a sufficient for a removal of office for a duly elected president of the United States? It doesn't. And especially so, especially so when we are in an election year. I am not going to take the time, your time, which is precious, to go over in each and every allegation about witnesses that I could. I could do it. I could stand here for a long time. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say this. They created the record. Do not allow them to penalize the country and the Constitution because they failed to do their job. With that, Mr. Chief Justice, we yield our time.